We're continuing in the book of Second John. In fact, this morning we are completing the book of Second John as we uh, end that part of the series. It's still continuing with the book of Third John, so we're not entirely completed yet. Um, but we'll take a break next week um, as we celebrate Father's Day and Youth Day. So we'll take a break and have a, a message for our fathers and, and our youth. Um, and then we will commence with 3 John the week after that. Now in the last two weeks, John has affirmed his, his readers in their commitment to walking in the truth. But he's also exhorted them to continue in love. That was last week's um, message, or the heart of last week's message. We need to have the balance of truth and love in our hearts and lives. John, for a brief moment, changes the topic by warning his readers to the threat posed to their faith by a group of teachers who have gone out into the world. In verse 7, John uses that exact same phrase. He says, gone out. Because it underlines the fact that these missionary teachers are in reality cessationists. People who have broken fellowship with the elder and the community of believers. But also people who have broken fellowship with the word of God. The thing is, they used to be in. They used to be a part of the community. But they have gone out following their own teaching. And by doing so, they turned their backs on God and His Word. Second John verses 7 to 13 reads as follows. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching... Do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. John starts off this discussion with an open reminder that those who left the community because they refused to follow the teaching of Christ have in fact departed from the truth itself. The language that John uses is quite strong and deliberate. You heard those two words. In relation to both the truth and the community, these men and women should be seen as the deceivers and the antichrist. Now that's quite harsh. But the reality is, if we turn our back on Jesus, when we turn our backs on the truth of God's word, then we are anti then we are anti-God, we are anti-Christ, because we are opposed to the truth of the Word of God. And that was exactly what John was warning his, the believers against. And I've put this in caps and bold and everything that I could. Do not welcome wrong teachers. Do not welcome wrong teaching. Do not welcome wrong teaching into your life. And do not welcome wrong teachers into your home and into your life. And we are called, as the title of this morning's message says, to be opposed to troublemakers. 
Firstly, I want to say that we need to beware of the world and worldliness. Beware of the world and worldliness. Because firstly, we live in a world where everything goes. We live in the world that has such blurred boundaries that we don't even know what is acceptable, what is right, what is true. As I said last week or the week before, everything is relative to personal truth and personal experience. Everything goes. You see, it's my truth that matters, not the truth. That is what our world is saying. The world is saying that we must be mindful of personal choices. We have to be mindful of different traditions and beliefs. We can't say certain things because it might offend. Just about everything is accept acceptable as long as it, would it fits within the rules of the land, even though the rulers of the land don't seem to think the rules apply to them. And yet in the, in the world where every, everything seems to be allowed and is seemingly normal, we aren't allowed to talk Christianity. We aren't allowed to speak the name of Jesus in our schools. We aren't allowed to speak the name of Jesus in our workplaces, in our, our communities, in places and in different situations. We aren't allowed to speak Jesus. We don't have the freedom to speak because that takes away other people's freedom to not hear. You see, we live in a world where everything seems to go. But we also live in a world that is full of false teachers. Not just teaching that is, is contrary to the word of God. We live in a world where people are bringing false messages. And perpetuating the problem and making it even more difficult for those who want to live. Those who want to show. Those who want to speak the truth. You see the danger with false teachers in the world is that the world seems to like their teaching. It's easy on the ears. It makes me feel comfortable. It makes me feel happy. It makes me seem to be good. You see, the world latches on what they say because it sounds like a good gospel. So what happens is people think they are saved because they follow the seemingly good word. But in actual fact, this word is filled with half-truths and inaccuracies. Another danger is that Christians who might still be new in their faith can so easily fail and fall to these half-truths, thinking that it is the truth because, they lack, because of their lack of depth. So they do not recognize what it is. And John takes a minute to warn us about this thing. John warns us to depart, to depart from those who are deceivers. To depart from those who are the Antichrist because they are professionals in luring you into their lair and into their den of lies. Secondly, John warns us about the world and worldliness, but he also encourages us to hold fast to the truth. And that is my second point this morning, that is holding fast to the truth. And I have four elements that, that come up from this word in this passage. Firstly, the first element is the teaching. We need to hold on to the teaching. What is the teaching? That Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. What does this mean? Well, we, we have just shared around the communion table, so we, we know what that means, or we should know what that means. Jesus Christ came in the flesh, which made the experience of last week's benediction, verse 3, the grace of God, the mercy of God, and the peace of God possible. You see, Jesus came in the flesh, died on that cross, giving us salvation, giving us forgiveness, giving us hope and eternal life with the Father. You see, Jesus Christ came in the flesh in order to make atonement for the sins 
that cut people off from this grace, this mercy and peace that is freely given to those who are saved. So firstly, we need to hold on to the, to the teaching. Secondly, we need to hold on to the call. And that is hold fast to what you have. What is it that we have? We are, said to, we are told to hold fast to this truth. What is it that we are to hold on to? Is it through obedience to God and His Word, and in faith in Jesus Christ, we have both the Father and the Son. And if we continue to walk in the light and the truth and in love, we will have the Father and the Son. You see, this is exactly what John is telling us. Hold on to the Father and the Son. Hold on to the teaching which you have heard from the beginning as we read last week. John wants us to hold on because the Father says that he wants or he desires authentic fellowship with us. God desires to have authentic relationship with us. As Tyron mentioned this morning, this is not about tradition. This is about relationship. God desires to have not just any relationship, but authentic relationship with us. So John is saying, don't lose this relationship which you cherish by falling for the things of the world. Don't lose what you have because what the world shows might, might seem to be attractive in the here and now. He's saying hold on to what you have so that you can stand. Don't lose this grace. Don't lose this mercy. Don't lose this peace. Simply because what the world is offering looks attractive in the here and now. Thirdly, he gives the warning. And he says this. What is this warning? Don't run ahead. So John gives another warning. Last week was the first warning. This week is the second warning in this passage. And he says, do not run ahead. Now what does this actually refer to, this running ahead? And I found it quite funny, Francois, Natalie, and Nikki, that the Word of God tells us not to run. So for those of you who like running, the Bible actually says, don't run, walk. Okay, that's not exactly what it says. And this has also got nothing to do with speed. But what John is referring to here is more about the journey and the destination. You see, the cessationists ran ahead of the teaching they had heard from the beginning, adding on some things and removing other things. They were running ahead of God. Don't we often do that? We, we run ahead because we want something to happen now instead of waiting on God for the right time. You see, we shouldn't run ahead. John was warning them in verse 9, that when you run ahead of God and do not continue in the teaching of Christ, you actually end up losing God altogether. Because you are running for self. You are running for your own glory. And instead of running towards God and following His teaching, you are running in the opposite direction. Here's the thing. If you run ahead, you are actually running away from. When you run ahead from the thing that you should be running to, you are actually increasing the distance between what is important, what you should be running to, and where you are going. You're increasing the distance because your speed is ahead of where God is. So instead of running ahead, adding on to our own story, adding information, taking on things into our hearts that we believe because it feels good, it seems good, it sounds good, 
we actually are running away from what God wants for us. We are running away from what comes next. And that is the promise. That was the fourth element of holding to the truth, is the promise. And that, John says, is a full reward. You see, when we continue to walk in faith, when we continue to walk in the light, in the truth, and in love, there is a promise of a reward. Now again, we mustn't just walk for the promise. But we must walk by faith. And the reward of that faith is the promise that God is giving us. You see, the teaching that brought us life, the teaching that will continue to give you life, John is saying, remain in that. The teaching, the word of God that brought life, that brought forgiveness, that brought unity, that made a way for me to be able to access the Father, that word, John is saying, we need to remain in that. Remain in what you heard from the beginning. If you don't lose that which you have worked for, you'll be fully rewarded. So John states that we need to keep walking in the light and in the truth and in love. And rather than running ahead on the easy path offered by these teachings that pop up, this new teaching that John refers to, rather than falling for those things that sound good, that sound easy, John calls upon his readers to remain loyal to the teaching of Christ. And not just to remain loyal, but to persevere to the end in their commitment to truth and love. As was commanded by the Father, and as is modeled by the Father's Son, Jesus Christ. Persevere in the message that you have heard. Lastly, a third point, John instructs us to oppose the error. John instructs us to oppose the, ever, the error. And he's quite direct with this message. We need to firstly oppose the deceivers and the antichrist. No one who has the father and the son should share in the wicked work in which these deceivers or antichrists are engaged. No one who follows the work of the Father, who has been called into the presence of God, must get involved with these deceivers or the antichrist. We have to bear in mind that the outcome of the work done by these false teachers is that people move away from the from the sun. That was what they were teaching. They were teaching that you move away from the sun, from Jesus Christ. And as a consequence of that, they were cut off from the Father. And John is basically saying to us in this passage that if you, dis if you support these deceivers, if you support these antichrists, you are basically supporting what they are teaching and what they are preaching. If you allow these people into your lives, into your homes, allow their words to sink in, you are basically supporting what they stand for. He ends off by saying that anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. That is quite heavy because we, we have family members, we have friends, we have neighbors who might follow a different teaching. And John is saying to us, don't allow those words, don't allow that teaching to penetrate your heart. Don't allow that in your home, don't allow that in your life. Because the minute that you do, it starts to impact your life. And the minute that you do, you are supporting and agreeing 
or buying into the words that they are speaking. And they want to say this next, don't buy or sell the lie. Don't buy or sell the lie. Don't get involved with people who are promoting the lie. If you buy the lie, you're just as bad as those who sell the lie. I think that is very um, evident in our, our steel workers here at the end of Plantation Road. If you buy the copper wires, you're just as bad as those who stole it. Don't buy the lie. You see, as followers of Christ, as those who look forward to the inheritance that has been promised for us, we shouldn't get involved with these things. We shouldn't, we shouldn't even welcome these things into our hearts and lives, into our homes. I want to conclude with this. That we need to work for what is good. Who opened? Tyron, uh, Nigel opened the message this morning speaking about various jobs. But our responsibility in our spiritual walk is something that we also need to work for. And so lastly, I want to say that we need to work for what is good. Work for what is good so that we can impact the hearts and lives of those who are watching. You see, authentic faith, the faith of the church, the faith that truly saves, is the faith that is loyal to the teaching of Christ as it was first received and then passed on to subsequent generations. You see, we must be loyal to the word of God. We must persevere in these promises. We must persevere even though it might seem difficult, as Cash shared in the testimony this morning. We need to persevere and hold on to our faith. We need to remember this also. We are inheritors, not inventors. We are inheritors of a message, not inventors of the message. We are inheritors of this message that was given to us. And we need to remember what was at stake when we received this message. Namely, the true gospel of God. We will do well to dwell on and to hold on to the truth of God's word. But we will do even better when we do that and also oppose all that is false. You see, we can't have the truth and say we stand for the truth, but still allow some of the world in, some of the falseness, falsehood of the world into our lives. We need to be opposed to what the world is preaching. Even if we find ourselves to be out of step with the world. Nowhere in, the, in scripture do you read that we need to be in step with what's happening in the world. We need to be in step with what God is teaching. We need to be in step with what God's word speaks. So that yes, we will be out of step with the world. But they will recognize something. They will recognize what is happening in our hearts and lives. And they will desire to do that. Have you ever seen a group of, let's leave the ladies out of this, a group of guys dancing? <laughs> there will be the guys that have the moves that's with the beat. And then there will be the guy that's clicking off beat. And clapping off beats. And you can see he's looking at everybody else because he wants to be on beat. He wants to follow the rhythm. But as much as he tries, his click and his clap is just off. We must be like that guy. We must desire what we see. Sorry, we must be like the clappers. And the world must be like that guy. 
desiring to, to do and be and receive what we have. You see, God has blessed us with so much. And it is of vital importance that we don't just say it, show it, and live it on Sundays in this holy group. But that the world sees us, hears us, and experiences us living in the light, living in the truth, and loving God. I can see my notes that I made this morning at Hoppus 5 didn't update. But let me turn to the last few verses quickly. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy might be complete. I wanted to end off with that and just remind us of the importance of this face to face thing we do. It is of vital importance that we connect with each other face to face so that we can be encouraged by each other, so that we can be strengthened by each other, so that, as John says, our joy may be complete. We mustn't just listen to the messages on the radio. It's good. We mustn't just look at the messages on YouTube and on God TV and all of that. That's also good. But we need this face-to-face communion with each other. Because that is when our joy is made complete. That is when we can share our hearts, as we saw this morning. That is when we can be real with each other. That's where we can see each other. I saw someone run down to go and pray for one of uh, our sisters. That doesn't happen on TV or on the radio. That happens in community. When we can see one of our flocks hurting, we go and love on them. We go and support them. When we can see our brother or sister struggling, we are there. We can help. We can love. This is of vital importance. And I'm so glad to see our chairs filled up this morning. Because this community is what God calls us to. So that we can walk in light, walk in the truth, walk in love, and encourage each other on the path together. Because as was said, I can't remember who said it this morning, but sometimes the path is difficult. Sometimes it's, it's not always easy going. But that's exactly when we need to hook our arms in with our brothers and sisters. And we need to say, I'm going with you. Let's do this together. Let's go and step in the light together. Let's walk in the truth together. Let's show God's love together. This is of vital importance. Don't ever lose the desire to be with each other. Because that is a great source of encouragement. Amen. Church, I want to encourage you to to continue walking in the light, in the truth, and in love. Father God, we are so grateful for your word this morning and the reminder for us, Lord, to continue walking in the light, in the truth, and in love. Lord, it is so important that we don't just take one of those three elements. But it is of vital importance that we apply all three to our life and journey so that we can speak the truth in love. So that the truth is seen in the light that we are walking in. Lord, it is our desire to walk in your truth and your love. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to stand firm even when opposing messages or gospels are being preached, that we would stand firm on the truth that we have heard from the beginning. Lord, that your word will be our strength, our guide. Lord, that your word, which is the double-edged sword, would help us to fight our battles and to be victorious. If it wasn't for you and your word, Lord, we would be like someone without 
a navigation app, trying to find a destination. So Lord, let us turn to your word. Let us turn to you in prayer. As you navigate us through this journey on earth. We ask, Lord, that you would bless us and guide us now as we go into this week. Won't you go with us and strengthen us? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Won't you stand with me as we receive the benediction? And then we're going to sing the closing chorus together. Join us for some coffee and tea at the back. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. God bless you. Let's stand and sing our closing chorus together. Thank you.